Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. In this week's episode, we explore the soft truths, United States Special Operations Command's core values. These truths have defined the culture of SOCOM since 1987. They connect special operators across the different service components into a common sense of purpose. And that's an important point to consider. A lot of people don't realize that while we often talk about special operations forces as a dedicated entity, they actually exist within the services under the standard organized, train, and equip function. They are assigned to special operations command when it comes to operational employment. It's the standard service-COCOM relationship. So this notion of a foundational ethos is really important. And we're talking about this on the Aerospace Advantage podcast because Air Force Special Operations is a key player in this mix. So with that, today's episode is going to focus on the first soft truth. Humans are more important than hardware. As technology permeates today's battlefield and performs missions humans once did, what does this notion of soft valuing humans over hardware really mean? United States military and senior leaders emphasize that humans are our strategic advantage and advocate for a human-first approach. We will discuss the first soft truth and its relevance to the conventional force. Finally, How can the Department of Defense emphasize the importance of our human capital when the budget is geared towards the procurement of new hardware? So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jim Hondo Gertz. He has served as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition, and he's also spent time as the Acquisition Executive for the United States Special Operations Command. Bottom line, he's a hugely important figure for the soft community. Hondo, welcome to the show. Awesome. Great to be here with you guys. Our next guest is a National Security Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Belford Center and served as a two-time squadron commander leading the Air Force's Special Warfare Recruiting Squadron and the 23rd Special Tactics Squadron. He was also a task force commander in Jordan and South Syria. Lieutenant Colonel Steve Cooper is a tip-of-the-spear warfighter, and we're thrilled to have him joining us on the show today. Steve, welcome. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Good to be here. And I also want to welcome one of our Air Force Fellows, Sarah Brame. She's an active duty Air Force colonel who wrapped up commanding the 34th Special Operations Squadron at Herbert Field in Florida, flying the U-28A. And that's one of the coolest airplanes in our inventory that few really know about. But trust me, the airplane and the people who fly it have been huge over the past two decades. It's awesome to have her as part of the Mitchell team. So Sarah, welcome back to the Aerospace Advantage. Hi, Slick. Happy to be here. All right. Now, Sarah, I want to begin with you. Let's kick off this show by defining what it means to be a special operator and what special forces are at large. I think we all have an idea in our mind of what it is, but let's tighten up the definition from you. Sure, Slick. Special Operations Forces, SOF, are a unique community within the U.S. military, specifically organized, trained, and equipped to perform special operations. Special operations embrace a wide range of unorthodox, comparatively low-cost, potentially high-payoff, often covert or clandestine methods that national, subnational, and theater leaders may employ independently in peacetime to support nuclear, biological, chemical, and or conventional warfare of low, mid, and high intensity. With a separate and distinct organizational culture from the conventional military, SOF invests heavily in training and operates in small teams of carefully selected operators. Within the military, SOF are considered to be at the tip of the spear or at the forefront of the action and serve as an instrument of national policy with their versatility, readiness, and ability to operate in any environment. SOF are different from conventional forces due to their distinctive organizational culture, resulting from the selection and training of their operators and the missions they perform that is defined by both their strategic or operational intent as well as their unique characteristics. Yeah, I really appreciate you you bringing that context to us because I think, especially over the last 20 years, folks think that they understand what SOF does. You really did a nice job breaking it down because they do so much more than we see in the movies. And I tried to provide some context in the introduction, but you're the expert here. So can you walk us through the SOF truths and what are their origins and why do they matter? 
Yeah, part of Soft's distinctive culture are the Soft Truths, where they're basically core values or maxims that distill the essence of what Soft does, means, and is. They started off back in 1987 when Army Colonel John M. Collins published the Soft Truths as part of a study. He was a member of the Special Operations Panel of the Readiness Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee in support of the Nun Cohen Amendment. And he was a senior specialist in national defense, but he had no special operations experiments. And despite being an outsider of the community, Collins' his insight on the unique characteristics of special operators regarding their selection, assessment, training, commitment, and culture were noteworthy. The role and responsibilities of SOF create a distinctive organizational culture with the un- unique values and a mission that is separate from the conventional American military culture. Collins' goal was to help clear up misunderstandings among the government over special operations threats, capabilities, limitations, and relationships with the rest of the U.S. security apparatus. Then his findings resulted in the five original soft truths, which are, first, humans are more important than hardware. That's the one we're really going to be talking about today. Second, their quality is more important than quantities. Third, soft cannot be mass-produced. Fourth, competent soft cannot be created after emergencies occur. And then lastly, most special operations require non-soft assistance. Yeah, that's such a great rundown. And especially when you bring us back to the time in the 80s, really when SOF was really being developed, it's incredible. And one of the big things to point out for SOF in general is they are not afraid to take the best information from wherever they can get it and build it into their culture, which is obviously one of their strengths. And this is a great rundown of how that's done. I've got to ask, though, how have the truths evolved over time? You think about special forces in the 80s, and then you consider all of the missions and circumstances over the next three decades. We're talking about a hugely transformative period. Yeah, that's a great question, Slick. So you asked about the evolution of the soft truths. Back in 1988, Major General David Barado was the commander of the JFK Special Warfare School and Center, and he adopted the truths, calling them soft imperatives. They served as a basic guidance for soft units after his staff had showed him Collins's work. And then in 1999, General Barado briefed the soft truths to General Wayne Downing, who used them as a way to codify the need for quality people as he commanded U.S. Army Special Operations Command. General Downing later became the third commander of U.S. SOCOM in 1993, and he promoted the soft truths across the command. So today, soft personnel embrace the truths as their core values and guiding principles. For people outside of soft, the soft truths may be, appear to be generic statements or platitudes. However, for those of us in the soft community, the truths are so revered that they have almost become religious dogma that appears in every promotional video and on posters in nearly every building in the command. Yeah, these are incredible things that, again, build out your culture. And I want to get Mr. Gertz in here on this conversation. Hondo, sir, how did the soft truths impact your time at SOCOM? And if you can help our listeners understand how the acquisition of systems relates to the first soft truths, which is humans are more important than hardware. You know, technically speaking, you were super focused on the equipment given your job, but given the notion of this principle, I'm guessing it really impacted your thinking. Yeah, thanks, Slick. It, it is not lost on me that the, the person in charge of all the equipping is talking about the first off truth that humans are import, more important than hardware. But as Sarah mentioned, it's a cultural entity that really drives the behaviors of an organization. And how it applied to me leading the team that was equipping and supporting the force was never forgetting why you were doing something. You weren't doing something to create a cool looking helicopter or a a cool looking airplane like the U-28. It was about what's the impact it's gonna have on the force and the mission the force is trying to accomplish. And in in commercial terms, people talk about user-centered design. It's been the buzzword. What it really means is your job is not to provide a piece of equipment. Your job is to enable those on point to be able to do the missions that they've been asked to do on behalf of the nation. And so it's just constant focus on why does it matter to the end user and not getting, not falling in love with a particular piece of gear or a particular program or not continuing a program if it wasn't having a positive impact on mission and then being very agile in your thinking about it. When I was a career Air Force guy, it's great to be back here with with all my Air Force peeps. I was doing big things like X-35 
aircraft and jazz and cruise missiles and stuff. I had not come from a soft community. And I was, when I got that as my second 06 command to go to SOCOM, right at the height of the war in 06, I was taken a little bit aback. Uh, but the culture there is one of the things we say is you don't measure your value by proximity to the final objective. And it's this kind of team sport of what do we all need to do to contribute our unique skills, talents, and passions to enable the operator. And so that's as an acquirer, it was very easy for me to figure out, okay, that is, I'm going to measure every single thing I and the team I'm leading do in through the eyes of the operator, not through the eyes of a piece of did the program deliver on time or schedule or all that. Uh, Those were all secondary. And so it's a really interesting and impactful way to bring a team together to achieve more than the sum of its individual parts. Hondo, I mean, those words really hit hard. I'm hopeful that they do call you every once in a while and get your guidance on things like F-35 and other programs that make the negative news. But staying focused here, because I'm sure you and I could have some incredible conversations, I want to focus back on this post-9-11 era. Uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other zones of engagement were obviously incredibly soft-centric. How did you see that impact this ideal? These conflicts had to have impact on the community just tremendously. Yeah, but again, if it's all about the mission and it's all about enabling those wherever they are in the force, it frees you up from a lot of the things that can bureaucratically create suboptimization. And quite frankly, it was very much like the Air Force culture that I joined pre-Desert Storm, right? Aim high, decentralized execution, right? Jam, jam. And what that enables you to do is then find the best solution wherever it comes from. Um, Whether it's an operator-driven idea, whether it is a non-traditional performer. And so this constantly challenging yourself. And I would equate it to three kind of core traits that I think are useful for any listener to think about. Because when I think about transformational periods, when I think about those leaders that you know, you just wanted to follow anywhere that really had an impact. They had three core traits to me. They were always curious, right? They didn't just take the first answer. They're always trying to learn more, ask more, right? So they had the curiosity to explore. Then they had the humility to learn. So they didn't just look for ideas that agreed with what they thought going in. And then finally, they had the boldness to act. And I think if you take the soft truths and then take those three traits, That's those are the traits that enable a force like SOCOM to have an outsized impact. And then didn't do it alone. They did it with the force. SOCOM did a program, then they handed it to the Air Force. The Air Force called it Project Liberty. That enhanced the joint force. So it was a very collaborative kind of approach, again, with this, what's the impact to the mission, and how can we enable those that are executing the mission to do those safely, effectively, and boldly. Yeah, the great thing about this podcast and the network that we have, Sarah has invited Steve here, and you are the end user, right? So Steve, you want to hop in and get your take on all of this? Sure, thank you. I think the soft truth that humans are more important than hardware, it's not an accident that that's the first soft truth. A lot of times, some high-level missions that I've been a part of Uh, Those things were planned with clear commander's intent, but the way to actually solve the problem or to achieve the objective was developed uh, by team members at the team level or below. Uh, So it's not necessarily a group or squadron commander coming up with how we're going to achieve the mission. Uh, That leader will just give a clear commander's intent, and then the men and women at the team level will actually solve the problem and then brief that up for approval. Additionally, I've been a part of some missions where we intentionally put hardware at risk to minimize the risk of force. So think remotely piloted aircraft, putting those things in harm's way or putting them out in front to soak up some of those surface to air threats so that the environment could be a bit safer when people on the ground close in on the objective. Hondo, sir, I want to get back to you. Given your role at SOCOM, there's so many experiences I'm sure that you can share with us where these soft truths help provide important context and a compass on how your team worked a solution amidst the tough challenge. The pressures had to be extremely hard given the ops tempo and the combat demands. 
Yeah, we certainly was a lot of that. But again, if you wrap yourself back into kind of mission and supporting those where wherever your customers are, right? If you're in the Air Force, your customer may be a ground unit that you're supporting or maybe a naval unit, right? If you get into this idea of extreme customer focus, it allows you to break down what tend to be stovepipes. And U-28 is a great example. We took that from idea to first squadron deployed in about five to six months. A lot of that was the human side of it. It was, at the time I was the acquisition lead, my counterpart, the U-28 squadron commander, squadron Sarah, would eventually come in. We were talking daily, if not hourly, what do you need? What can I get you? I can't do it this way. How about if we do it that way? And back to Steve's point, in a very decentralized manner. And so we had commander's intent, deploy the squadron to have this effect. Uh, but then we operated in a much more decentralized manner. And I think when you do that, folks get fired up about solving problems. They get very frustrated about beating their heads against bureaucracy and being told you know, what to do down to the 15th step. I go back to that old Air Force principle, right? Centralized control, decentralized execution. I think when you create that kind of environment and you trust each other, I had great trust in the customers I was supporting. They had trust that uh, the team I was leading would get them what they needed to do the job. Then you can operate at that speed of trust. And that's when amazing things happen and you can invent a squadron both on the manpower side, the tactics side, the training side, and the equipping side in less than six months. Because it's not just about the equipment. It's about the training. It's about the tactics. It's about the logistics. And the way we would solve that is bring everybody into the room at once. We didn't shuffle a bunch of paper right there and have honest conversations. Uh, and that allowed us to then enable that speed of trust to have outsized impacts downrange. And quite frankly, yeah, the op tempo was hard, the pressure was hard, but everybody loved that environment. That that environment, the pressure gets diffused amongst the whole team, not just one or two members. And that's when you know you're really cooking with gas. That is probably one of the things that I miss about being in the Air Force on active duty the most is those high pressure scenarios, but everybody is just running on all cylinders. And if you could harness that electricity you could do a lot with it. It's absolutely incredible. Hondo, I want to expand the aperture here and talk about the time. As you transition from being SOCOM's lead acquirer, serving as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition, did you see any areas where conventional forces could benefit from the soft truths? And what I'm really curious about is, can you help the audience understand why it's useful or why it isn't useful? I, I get it. There, it's two different worlds with different demands and cultures, but I'm guessing it also has a lot in common. Yeah, I think, quite frankly, it has much more in common than everybody would normally expect. Uh, and quite frankly, it was one of the reasons I felt very comfortable going into the special ops world from the Air Force, because the Air Force I joined back in the late 80s was that jam. We're getting ready for Desert Storm. We're very mission focused. And one of the reasons that I was excited about going to the Navy was as we pivoted to China, it and the Air Force are going to be leading the joint force in that fight. And a very similar, very complex problem, how do we get after it? One of the things, Steve mentioned it, I brought, I called it the four Ds to the Navy, which was my way of taking the soft truths and applying them to the $150 billion a year acquisition enterprise, right, this big team. And one of those was like massively decentralized the organization and really build and then leverage that trust. Differentiate the work. So we provided everybody many different tools to do the job and then held them accountable for creating the right outcomes based on picking those tools, right? Really leverage the power of digits. Another thing SOF has done because it's joint by nature, right? And then really focus on developing talent. And in three and a half years, we doubled the amount of, if I measure acquisition by how much we put on contract, we doubled the amount we put on contract, 75 billion to 150 billion, with 20% less contract actions and actually less people. And we didn't change the process or rules or anything. It was all about this mindset. And so I think if you get into that customer-focused mindset, 
and you really develop and then leverage the speed of trust, which is my way of encapsulating those soft truths. Those apply to anything. They apply outside in commercial industry. They apply to DOD. They apply to conventional forces. Soft has some unique elements, but it's part of the DOD joint force. And I've leveraged those truths uh, to great effect in many situations, uh, my time in the Navy and actually my time since I've gotten out. I do think they really keep you focused on the things that are most important. Yeah, it sounds just like an incredible leadership opportunity. And diving into that, how'd you work on helping share these perspectives with your new team and how did they respond? I think it's really, as a leader, people are really good. They're like bloodhounds, right? They can smell out leaders who are not as being truthful, being transparent, saying things, but not doing things. And so I think teams respond when they see leadership, trust them, right? We used to say in SOCOM, not a soft truth, but a soft saying, right? Trust till it hurts. And as soon as a team feels that there's that safety of trust, and that they can bring their unique talents, whatever they are, to the table, and that they'll be heard, and then if they're, they'll be incorporated in what the team's doing. It's amazing you can see. Like I said, in three and a half years, we doubled output with what I would say is just changing the mindset. Now, there's a thousand things you have to do to execute that on a daily basis, but I, soft truths really all add up to soft mindset which is the same as DOD mindset. And as you see us all trying to pivot towards these new challenges as a nation, it's all about how do we bring that mindset to bear and then enable those around. As a leader, you've got to trust people though. If you think you're going to make every decision and downward direct everything, you'll never operate at speed. And I think once the team kind of understood that, you know, it was interesting. The first thing I would rate it all of my, uh, These are senior flag officers, two and three stars, was they had to have a major initiative ongoing that had at least a 50% chance of failing. And that was the first thing I would rate them on their fit rep. Not because I wanted to fail, because I wanted to help the organization learn how to learn fast. And sometimes you learn fast by trying lots of things. But if all we do is measure people on what succeeds, you'll never try things. And again, that's part of this soft mindset. It's about sets and reps and iteration speed. And I think once the team understood that and understood it was more than just a motto on a slide, it was the way I was making decisions every day and the way I judge leaders making decisions every day. Man, it's unbelievable what an organization can produce when you get to that point. Yeah, sir, you hit on a key thing that I've been really lucky to observe for the last few years working closely with SpaceX, and that's not being afraid to fail and taking that bit of risk and knowing that you're not going to get in trouble for not having the 100% solution at go time, because that's where the learning happens. And yeah, it's really exciting to hear the environment that you created where folks could really get after it. I want to bring Steve and Sarah into the conversation because you both have incredible command experience in garrison and in combat and drawing on those experiences. Can you share any war or operational stories that relate to the first soft truth? So I'll kick it off with Steve. Sure. Thanks. So I've been thinking about this quite a bit. And I said before, it's good to have clear commander's intent so that our juniors can actually develop the specific solutions and ways to attack or solve problems. When I went through a selection for a specific unit, we, I was in an operator training course, and one of the chiefs pulled me aside during a mission planning simulation, and he said, you're never going to outthink the guys, so stop trying to do that. And what he meant was, like, you as an individual or as a leader are not going to have all the answers. And in fact, with clear intent, your folks will present you better answers or better solutions than you could have ever come up with. And so in working as part of Task Force Jordan, there was there were some problems with some effects to air superiority with certain threats. And so some of our aircraft were being pushed out of the area that we needed them to operate in. So we used some of our joint park partners and some of our uh, junior service members to come up with some non-kinetic solutions to keep those threats at bay and to create a safer environment, specifically for fourth generation fighters. And then another example is the rescue attempt of Luke Summers. So Luke was held 
um, as a hostage by Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or AQAP. And the actions on the objective were developed by E7s and below. And I think that is incredible. And also, we put a lot of our aviation platforms at a bit of risk because of the environment over there and because of the time constraints on that mission. But the lead task force commander deemed that worth it because we were going to put a whole lot of people on the objective and we needed to keep them safe and provide them the best chance for potential success. And then finally, with test and evaluation, a lot of our junior service members test out weaponeering solutions, weapons, kit, equipment, and a lot of that is now used by conventional forces. Examples of this are shooting optics, weapons that maybe you, with rifles, you float the barrel to make the projectile a lot more accurate, but none of that matters if you don't have a quality shooter who can outshoot the gun when the barrel's not floated. Uniforms, helmets, body armor, a lot of that stuff that was tested and evaluated by special operations folks now is in use in the general purpose force. So that's my initial shot. Yeah, sounds good, Steve. I'll jump in with some of my experiences as a squadron commander. Every decision I made as a squadron commander was based on the people. If the people weren't in a good spot, the mission would fail. I didn't spend my time thinking about airplanes or logistics. I I just spent my time thinking about the people I had and the people I didn't have. It, It was so that we could leverage the right talent to be in the right place and at the right time. For example, like weapons officer placement. The Air Force invests a lot of training in these officers. They add value to the organization with their depth of knowledge and instructional ability. So we need to make sure that they're placed in the right position, not only to invest in them as individuals, but to get return from them. And thinking about people, it's not only their jobs, it's also their lives. So as a commander, you become aware of your people and their families, their successes and their struggles. Like like Stephen Hondo said, you develop trust with the people so that you can accomplish the mission together. So as a commander, it's where you invest your time, what you measure, what you look into and learn about. It's where you spend your time. And for me, it was the people. So that definitely shows that humans are more important than hardware. And then talking about the hardware side of things, Hondo had mentioned how rapidly the U-28 went from idea to being employed on the battlefield. And humans were the catalyst for that. U-28s are an exquisite yet inexpensive platform compared to other planes in the inventory. They've got great capability but they're also, frankly, replaceable. So if we needed to, we could buy a new aircraft as we need if the situation arose. However, you can't get a new co-pilot or aircraft commander overnight. Training them takes time. Developing them takes personal interaction. This ties both into the first soft truth and the fourth soft truth, which is that you can't create competent soft after the emergency occurs. That's the struggle, right? That is the the key component. And hopefully we as an Air Force continue to focus on people and generating the right folks. It's just incredible to hear both of your perspectives. So I appreciate that. I do want to ask Hondo, sir, while we have you here, looking at the future with the United States focus on China, last summer you co-authored an article in the National Interest called Forging the Industrial Network the Nation Needs. Can you talk us through how humans are the pillar of the network of systems and can make this team of teams really be more agile and ready. Yeah, thanks. The real meat of that article is that we've got to transition from kind of industrial age thinking into network thinking. And I think SOCOM, because it's a joint force by nature, because of the pressures of the missions and because of this, of the soft truths that underpin them, it was, it's a great leading example of the type of network we have to create as a nation, as a joint force, and as individual teams if we're going to be both secure and prosperous as a nation going forward. And again, that network is powered by humans, right? Sometimes we get caught up talking about equating a capability to a piece of equipment. And as Bolser and Steve mentioned, Right, a capability is a combination of the equipment, the tactics, and the training. And as, you, as we think about getting back on a global competitive step, what Joan Votel and I tried to lay out was this positive vision of what right looks like. And the key central element of that is a network powered by enabled and capable humans. And it it doesn't say soft truths per se, but 
you can certainly get that sense of with the right mindset, with these kind of truths as an underpinning, you can create the network, this team of teams that will ensure that as a nation, we can be both safe and prosperous going forward. And that was the main take on that. And it's gotten a lot of, I think people can understand building a network and they understand that network's got to be powered by people who are talented, trained and empowered. And I think that's what we were trying to lay out in that piece. Yeah, yeah, I could not agree more, sir. I want to get Steve back in here because SOF played a leading role in the global war on terror, as we know, and as the U.S. Department of Defense prioritizes China as the pacing threat. Steve, where do you see and where do you think SOF forces will be a key player and what will it look like? Sure, thank you. I think it will depend a lot on what the actual objectives are. As Indo-PACOM is a very large area, I think it's our largest combatant command. But that said, there's a whole lot of water in Indo-PACOM. China has a very big coastline. And so it would make practical sense to get back to some of our TTP development in terms of maritime operations, specifically to enable placement and access of either us or surrogate forces. Additionally, a lot of the work we do is based on the trust that Hondo mentioned. It's based on the partnerships that we already have existing. So think AUKUS, think the partnerships that we have in South Korea with Japan. In the open source, you can read about special operations and their, some of their happenings in Taiwan right now. Former Secretary Mattis reminds us that if we're going to go to a gunfight, bring all your friends with guns. And so that doesn't happen overnight. Those relationships have to be formed. They have to be solidified and based on the trust that Hondo mentioned. So I think leveraging our existing relationships, expanding on them, letting them know clearly where we stand and the strength of our partnership so that we can enable other countries to also take action, not just having the United States operate alone or having the U.S. in a leading role all the time. So I think those relationships are hugely important. Some of the exercises that take place in Indo-PACOM, very important for interoperability and very important to demonstrate at the most junior level that, that trust and relationships really matter. Yeah, I could not agree more. Sarah, I definitely want you to weigh in on this. Yeah, for sure, Slick. Bottom line is I agree with Steve 100%. The Pacific is vastly different from the environments we've been operating in the last 20 years. And to overcome those differences and operational challenges in the Pacific theater, we need to have those options for access and placement, like Steve said. Humans are at the core of that mission. Humans who are empowered can advance our interests on the battlefield and can help come up with options. And they'll be preparing the battlefield to make us more lethal. And that really starts with the training that we're investing in right now. As the Air Force transitions to the four-gen, the force generation cycle, we've got deliberate crawl, walk, run training where units can train together, experiment with unique mission sets, or mission sets that are geared toward future conflict. And I think that with the ideas, the innovation, and the training side of things, that's how we're going to be more competitive in the future fight. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I, and I agree with everything that you said. <laughs> it's great stuff. All right. As always, we're getting short on time because I failed to look at the clock here. So I want to get your take on this last question. So the soft truce came out in the 1980s, and that was a unique period for the end of the Cold War. Post-9-11 ops were hugely impactful for SOF. The return to great power competition is going to drive major pressures for all of us in defense, including SOF. The tenants are enduring, but they're also living, right? How do you expect these truths to evolve? And what is your prediction on where they'll stand in, let's call it, 10 years from now? And what would you advise folks to consider as they steward the ethos? And we'll go, how about Hondo, Steve, and Sarah, we'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, just quickly, I think it's almost... The fifth soft truth was the silent truth. When I first got there 20 years ago, that most special operations require non-soft assistance. So I don't know that the truth will change, but I do think some of the emphasis on expanding partners and how do we leverage the, this mindset and make it applicable across the larger force while not losing the unique capabilities that soft brings. So... I don't see a lot of changes, but I do see maybe a little bit of change of emphasis, particularly on that last one of creating this network of partners at scale to allow us to compete at scale. From my perspective, I think 
that we as special operations should continue and even increase our professional development. Um, I'm very fortunate. I'm at the Harvard Kennedy School. Got to take a year to look, think, and study strategically. Secretary Mattis reminds us to be voracious readers. I think one of his quotes in his book, Call Sign Chaos, is to toward company grade officers where if you haven't read hundreds of books by about your 10 year mark, you're functionally illiterate. And that's because your experiences alone are not enough to sustain you. Uh, You can't experience everything that you'll need to know in order to lead effectively in combat. And so we need to continue professional development, especially with respect to China. I think the statistic is China has more honor students than the U.S. has students. They may also have more English speakers than we have And so we need to educate our folks. We need to continually develop them. And that should be a core part of our training in order to compete. Hey, Steve. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the professional development side of things. Part of the reason why I was particularly interested in studying and sharing knowledge about the soft truths is because when I was a student at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies at Maxwell Air Force Base, I wrote my thesis on the topic. And with the technological capabilities we have, I had started to kind of wonder whether humans really are more important than hardware. And I was thinking about how technology has afforded humans ways to be further and further from the battlefield. For example, the use of RPAs or space-based assets. And so in my thesis, I looked at ways to protect, or I looked at the ways we protect humans to allow them to better operate on the battlefield or in the skies over the battlefield. And without getting into all the specifics of my paper, my findings basically showed the valid- validity and value of the first soft truth. After all, Clausewitz said, war is a human endeavor. War is fundamentally a clash of wills often fought among populations. It's not a mechanical process that can be controlled precisely or even mostly by machines, statistics, or laws that cover operations in carefully controlled and predictable environments. Despite being only r- around for 35 years, I think the soft truths will absolutely stand the test of time. They're still relevant and can be a value not just for soft, but for the military as a whole. Yeah, I totally agree. And I've just got to say that this has all been absolutely fascinating and really appreciate the three of you giving our audience this unique look at one of the most intriguing communities in the Department of Defense. And you know, as a fighter dude, I definitely shared my time in the stack with special operations for aircraft while supporting soft missions and everybody on the ground. And learning about the soft truce is really going to help me better understand why soft is the way it is as an organization of highly trained professionals, and it's always great to get to work with you. So thank the three of you for being here on the Aerospace Advantage and can't wait for the next one. Thanks, Slick. Thanks so much. Thanks, Slick. Happy to be part of the conversation. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.